Good afternoon, and I want to welcome everyone to this inaugural event on equity, inclusion, and COVID-19. My name is Sean Maxim, Senior Associate Director for Institutional Diversity and Inclusion at Princeton University. I want to thank you all for joining us. Before we begin, I'd be remiss to uh, not thank our sponsoring offices, the Office of the Vice Provost for Internet, uh, Office of the Vice Provost for uh, Institutional Equity and Diversity, and the Office of the Associate uh, Provost for International Affairs and Operations. I also want to thank my colleagues uh, from many offices that helped put this together, Felicia Edwards, John DeLapp, Shante Stevenson, Kevin Hudson, Peter Novak, uh, the Offices of Instructional Support Services, Communications, all these people who helped put this together. Also want to thank our esteemed panelists, moderator, and everyone else who has collaborated with us to make this event happen. I now want to turn the virtual mic over to my colleague, Ali Casamartula, who will moderate today's event. Thanks, Sean. Hello and welcome to this panel about race in the COVID era. My name is Ali Qasim Ramtula, and I'm Princeton's Associate Provost for International Affairs and Operations. We're pleased you could join us today for this timely conversation about how long-standing xenophobia and racial inequalities in the United States have surfaced in and been amplified by the coronavirus pandemic. Within this broad topic, we will focus today's conversation in two areas. First, on the resurgence in violence targeting those of Chinese and Asian ancestry. And second, on the disproportionate health and economic impacts of the pandemic on Black, Latinx, Native American, and Asian American communities. When we organized this panel several weeks ago, the world had not witnessed the murder of George Floyd, a devastating tragedy which has re-energized and globalized the Black Lives Matter movement. Floyd's death is deeply connected to the racial disparities exposed by the pandemic. He died with coronavirus antibodies in his blood, surviving infection only to die at the hands of the police. Floyd, as well as Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery, Tony McDade, and countless others are not just victims of racism, but of a ubiquitous strain of fear, hatred, and aversion to black people that is deeply embedded in our culture, in our government, and in our institutions. Some activists and scholars have helpfully described this as anti-blackness. While today's session acknowledges the foundational nature of anti-blackness in shaping American life, and will absolutely be in conversation and dialogue with recent events, I want to clarify the particular contributions we hope to make to this broad conversation about race and the pandemic. First, to contextualize current events within the broad historical framework of race and racism in America. Second, to expand the prevailing black and white binary of race conversations and to place Asian Americans and African Americans into dialogue with each other. And third, to share both individual and institutional opportunities and actions that can advance racial justice in our society. Let me briefly introduce you to our distinguished panel. I'll ask each of them to wave when I mention their, their name. First is Representative Andy Kim, who is in his first term representing New Jersey's third congressional district. A career public servant who has worked with both Democrats and Republicans, Andy has served at the Pentagon, the State Department, the White House, and in Afghanistan with Generals Petraeus, working for Generals Petraeus and Allen. Next, we have Professor Beth Lou Williams, who is Associate Professor of History at Princeton. Beth's first book, The Chinese Must Go, Violence, Exclusion, and the Making of the Alien in America won five academic prizes within her field of history. She is a scholar of race and migration in the United States, specializing in Asian American history. Next is Professor Keith Weilu, who is Henry Putnam University Professor of History and uh, Public Affairs in the Woodrow Wilson School. He's also chair of the History Department. Keith's research straddles history and health policy, examining drugs and drug pol policy, health and the, the politics of health and healthcare, 
and the interplay of health and identity. And finally, we have Helen Zia, a Princeton alumnus of the great class of 1973, who is a journalist and activist and author. Most recently, she wrote a book entitled Last Boat Out of Shanghai, the epic story of the Chinese who fled Mao's revolution, which was a finalist for the Penn Award for Biography. She was recently profiled in the PBS documentary series, Asian Americans. Given the overwhelming interest in this session, our panelists have graciously agreed to extend from our original 60 minutes to 90 minutes. Unfortunately, uh, Andy Kim will not be able to, to join us for the full time, so he will leave uh, at five o'clock. We appreciate that not all audience members will be able to stay for the duration, and we encourage you to access the full recording uh, of this session, which will be available online um, later on today. Our goal is to have a robust and candid dialogue. To promote engagement between our speakers, I will be posing two questions at a time and giving panelists plenty of opportunities for crosstalk and cross-engagement. Dozens of audience-generated questions were submitted in advance of the session, and I will be integrating many of these into the conversation today. Before we jump into the questions, we'll have a lightning round of introductions. Let me invite each of our panelists to say just a few words about what brings them to this conversation. Uh, I'll start with Beth Lou Williams. Uh, hi, I'm really um, excited to join this conversation. Um, I join it as a historian who mostly spends my time thinking about the 19th century. I study violence and prejudice and exclusion um, against Chinese in the 19th century. And I think that um, from that perspective, the, the harassment and violence and hate that we're seeing in the present um, is, of course, deeply disturbing. Um, but also not completely surprising because it links to this longer history and I'm, I'm excited to talk more about that today. Thanks, Beth. Uh, Keith, over to you. So um, I'm a historian, but I also teach it in health policy and uh, I study disease and health in society and really think about how health and disease debates like the pandemic debate are really a microcosm and they reveal much about these underlying social tensions and commitments. This has been historically true. I study it both in the past and the present, whether the debates are around the failures or the role of government, the place of expertise in American society, or these questions of identity, race, and difference, which always seem to be both catalyzed and um, sort of energized in some way by the kinds of crises surrounding uh, health as we see today. So that's the framework that I bring to this conversation. Thanks, Keith. Helen? Hi, um, I first of all am appreciative of everybody involved in making this um, very important discussion happen. I come to this as a uh, journalist, an author, and an activist, and I suppose I should have said activist first. I started out as an activist in my high school, uh, which happens to be in Congressman Kim's district, and, uh, and then was on the Princeton campus at a time when the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, the women's movement were, ha were happening, and all of what we're going to be discussing today really uh, were top on the agenda at the time that I was at Princeton. And after I left Princeton, I um, did a variety of things, uh, but uh, ended up as a journalist really covering issues of social justice and have, as an activist, been involved in a lot of, um, uh, I guess I would say, anti-hate crimes um, activism, including a landmark uh, civil rights case again uh, involving an Asian American, Vincent Chin, in Detroit in 1982. So, um, so I've been pretty involved in what's going on today, and and I'm very eager to have a, a, a cross dialogue with everybody. Thank you, and finally, Andy. Yeah, thank you, Ali, and thank you everyone for having me. Um, I'm Congressman Andy Kim uh, from New Jersey. I, I try to bring a couple different perspectives here. One is uh, that I'm a member of Congress on the Select Committee uh, on the Coronavirus Crisis, 
a small 12 person bipartisan committee that's looking at, at all aspects of this from the financial side of things, the relief packages, to uh, some of the work we're trying to do on next steps, how to safely and responsibly reopen, prepare for a second wave, how we try to supercharge towards a vaccine. So uh, in fact, we just had a, a recent hearing of the select committee uh, about racial disparities when it comes to health with regards to the coronavirus crisis. Uh, but I also come to this as, as, as the only Korean American member of Congress, uh, as someone who has experienced a lot of the discrimination upfront and personal uh, in recent weeks and months, uh, as well as uh, just uh, some of the other approaches that I'm looking forward to add to this conversation. Great, thanks, Andy. Um, I'm gonna jump right into questions here. Um, I'm gonna start with a couple of questions that are focused on understanding and contextualizing the, the rise in anti-Asian violence. Um, and I'm gonna pose these to, to both uh, Helen and Beth. The first one is, uh, is posed to Helen. Um, we're painfully aware of the violence against black people. Uh, in recent years, we've also seen a rise in anti-Semitism and anti-immigrant and anti-Latinx violence. Some of the audience may not be aware that the anti-Chinese rhetoric that's been connected to the COVID crisis has led to a huge spike in anti-Chinese and anti-Asian American more broadly violence, including more than 1,700 incidents that have been reported over the last three months. Um, Helen, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how Asian Americans are responding to what you and others have described as a pandemic of violence that accompanies this viral pandemic. And then the question to Beth, um, anti-racism and xenophobia far predate this pandemic as you, as you mentioned in your introduction. As a scholar of Asian American history, how do you situate this surge of violence within, within that long history of, of particularly anti-Chinese but also anti-Asian sentiment as well as the broader racial history of the United States? Ali, um, let me start with the question you posed about this current, um, what I have been calling a second pandemic, following the, um, you know, the global uh, COVID-19 pandemic, there also has been a global pandemic of, of hate and uh, violence toward people who look Chinese, which encompasses really all East Asians. And, and since many people, including in the United States, think that all Asians are the same anyway, the lumping together effect really has, has meant there's been quite a lot of um, hostility, including violence toward anybody of Asian background. And um, as you point out, a lot of people are not aware that this has actually been going on a long time. And I, I think Professor um, Lou Williams will probably talk about how far back that goes in terms of Asian American history. But in this current spate, um, Asian Americans have noticed um, really as the news began in China, there was already a rise in antagonism, um, uh, vandalism, hostility, bullying, reports of children in schools being beaten up and sent to the hospital. And that was even before the uh, pandemic really hit North America. And once that happened, and especially in March, after um, the president's comments, you know, clearly blaming and targeting China started, the spike began. And uh, so there were a number of nonprofit groups that have established um, reporting websites, including one that now, as you point out, have uh, counted at least uh, really 1,700 as of May 20th. So I'm sure that number is far greater now. But um, they set those, that website, by the way, is stopaapihate.org. And it's in several Asian languages where people can report. And so we started seeing that. And the reaction to the, um, to the fact that Asian Americans were incredibly alarmed. I mean, the, the um, crosstalk and the networks were really just off the charts. They were exploding with people just saying, I'm afraid to walk my dogs, my parent, my elderly parents, you know, got attacked at a bus stop, um, people getting acid thrown on them. And of course, there's that her horrific incidents where a, a incident in Texas where a two-year-old and a six-year-old were stabbed with the intent to kill them by a man who said he wanted to kill all Asians because of the virus. Um, 
that that there was a lot of of course fear and um, what can we do kind of comments and what is this about um, and one of the more startling reactions was that people who are not Asian were like oh so you Asians now are discovering racism and the only real reply is it, to that is we've known about the context and dis of, of Asian Americans in this country with race. Uh, and the fact that people are unaware of it is part of the invisibility that Asian Americans have experienced. And that is part of the challenge that Asian Americans face with this onset of hate. And I should add that there is a, where we are in this moment today, with the Black Lives Matter movement, the you know the deaths of George um, George Floyd by uh, you know cold-blooded killing on video that was also aided and abetted by an Asian American police officer standing by, which is also on the video. So there's a lot of discussion now um, that's actually elevated the conversation among Asian Americans of, of where do we fit into this systemic uh, racism that exists in the United States. And so, so really the uh, virus of hate against Asian Americans now is also being talked about in the context of sy the systemic racism in this country, which I hope we can get into more. And I'll speak a little bit to the history. Um, so I think we already think typically about the late 19th century as a period where there was a lot of racial violence. Um, and so what I wanted to talk about is uh, sort of highlight the way that racial violence against Chinese um, and, and prejudice against Chinese was very particular at the time, and also how that particular forms of prejudice and violence we can see both in the past but now um, with resonance in the present. Um, so if we talk about how Chinese were viewed in the past, um, a lot of the stereotypes and the prejudice did center around the Chinese in the 19th century as being uh, dirty in some way or diseased, being unhygienic, um, being living together in crowded quarters in a clannish way, um, eating sort of strange foods and having backwards medical practices. So a lot of the rhetoric that we hear today um, about uh, concerns about uh, the Chinese as disease to really hark, um, resonates with the earlier prejudice against Chinese. But I would like to point out that it's not just the uh, rhetoric of disease that seems similar. The Chinese, when they arrived in the mid 19th century, were portrayed as sort of forever foreign, unable to assimilate, unable to Americanize. Um, and that meant that these, uh, this idea of them as diseased, that they could not be reformed, unlike other immigrants who may arrive with different cultures. The Chinese at the time and Asians more generally were also seen as labor competition um, and that they could take away jobs from uh, Americans, they would take American jobs. And I think that this also was linked to the idea that they were inassimilable, they themselves couldn't become Americans, that's why they were seen as an outside menace. In the 19th century, this prejudice, these, these ideas, uh, led to violence against the Chinese. Um, and it was everything from sort of harassment by uh, children, stone throwing in the street, to killing with impunity. Um, some of it, this violence was state-sanctioned. State uh, some of it was done by officers of the law. Um, I study in particular an outbreak of violence um, in which 165 communities across the West in 1885 uh, attempted to drive out their Chinese neighbors. Um, and so it, it unfortunately reminds us of, of, or it reminds me of, of the violence that we're seeing today. Um, but in the 19th century, this didn't stay with just um, violence and harassment. It also found its way into government policy. And so I wanted to say that we need to keep an eye out for that today as well. In the 19th century, uh, it cr created uh, racially discriminatory health policies, 
things like forced inoculation of Chinese, segregated hospitals, um, and also racially discriminatory quarantine practices. Um, but beyond the realm of health, the, these, this rhetoric about the Chinese as an outside threat and an assimilable threat also became fodder for an argument that they should be excluded from immigration um, and or should be deported, should be expelled. Um, and this led to more than 60 years of Chinese exclusion and then the exclusion of other Asian groups through immigration control. And I think we have to watch for this today um, in part because there's already a lot of talk about limiting Chinese immigration, immigrants in general, Asian immigrants. Um, I think it's not a coincidence that we hear anti-Chinese rhetoric out of um, President Trump one moment and then plan to um, cut back Chinese students um, the next. So we have to think about how this um, anti-Asian hate can, can move into the government as well. Thank you, uh, Beth and Helen, for that. You've, you've raised a lot of issues that I, I hope that we can get into. I, I want to bring um, Keith and, and Andy into the conversation. I'm going to pose two questions to them that are fo focused um, on the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on racial minorities. And I, I know they'll also have an opportunity to uh, respond to some of the interesting um, issues that you have surfaced in, in, in your initial responses. So let me start with Keith. Um, this pandemic, like many other crises, has magnified uh, existing inequalities, and we've seen dramatic disparities in the health and economic impact across racial lines. Um, one, one data point is that the fatality rate for Black Americans is roughly two and a half times that of white Americans. Um, so I'd, we'd, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about why we see these disproportionate impacts on Black lives, but also on Latinx and Native communities. Um, and then the question for Andy is, is a little bit uh, related to his point initially about um, serving on the House Select Committee on the Coronavirus Crisis. Would love to hear more. You, you referenced that uh, the committee has heard recently about the disproportionate impact and would love to hear from you what, what that committee heard from whom and, and what the committee heard. Um, and then also to, to sort of take it in, a, in the future direction, what, what is Congress uh, going to do in response to uh, what it has heard about the disproportionate racial impact of, of the pandemic on communities of color? How will that be effectuated or, or acted on? So yeah, so great questions. Uh, I would say that the, the way in which any disorder like uh, the coronavirus manifests itself in a society is not inherent to the virus. It really reflects a great deal about pre-existing uh, disparities, pre-existing challenges and problems. It's kind of like the, the impact of the coronavirus is layered atop an accretion of previous insults. And as a result, what you have then, and, and it takes the form of multiple institutions, it, it affects multiple institutions. So you have nursing homes, which are vulnerable because of particular kinds of ways in which the elderly are housed and cared for. You have prisons which are disproportionately African-American um, because of policies with regard to everything from drugs to criminal surveillance that, 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 is, that, that explains why you have higher rates of African-American mortality associated with prisons. You have meatpacking. You have the work of Latinos in rural, remote meatpacking industries where the proximity, the speed and deadly uh, efficiency of the transmission of the viruses explain differential rates of, of cases as well as mortality. And then you have uh, the African-American experience um, in many urban centers, but not exclusively, where you have living in high rises. I mean, it goes back to things like elevators and lobbies and the way in which you move through life. Um, 
uh, on public transportation. It's a very insidious virus as well, in the sense that it, you know, asymptomatic transmission means that two days, three days before you show symptoms yourself, you may be infecting others. So you have to kind of understand that, you know, the way in which this virus has really created a kind of a deadly threat uh, is layered atop a lot of different vulnerabilities, poverty being one of them, uh, which is, of course, you might say a reflection of long standing. The fact that it's an African American sort of the rates are much higher. For instance, in places like Wisconsin, you know, 6% of the population is black, but 27% of the deaths are black. This tells you something not about sort of black bodies, but about the situation of black life. And a particularly egregious example, a really stark one with regard to Native Americans um, in Arizona. Uh, or at least the boundaries of New Mexico, Arizona, and Southern Utah, you have the Navajo population, where 30% of the population doesn't have running water. For a virus where we are warned from the very outset that we have to wash our hands constantly. So you don't really have to think deeply and hard about why this virus has embedded itself in different parts of our world and different parts of our country without understanding, you might say, the, the situations of life, the way in which um, an epidemic breeds on existing disparities. I want to say one other thing about the, Native, the, the, the Asian American experience. Because you see, I mean, I think that one of the things that it's also unleashed with regard to um, our society is, as you pointed out, this kind of xenophobia and blame. And a colleague of mine, Ruth Rogaski, in a recent talk pointed out that, you know, to tell you a little bit about the capacity of for blaming Asian Americans is that you can find people who point to the so-called primitive Wuhan market and these exotic eating practices as the origin point of the coronavirus. But you can also find people who believe that it's a high tech, highly sophisticated Wuhan um, biomedical facility that manufactured the virus. Both of those things could be true at the same time for people. And it allows them to kind of tie an Asia, anti-Asian critique to explain why we face the kind of challenges we do. So it's a really insidious problem, but it's also an, insid it's an insidious disease, but it's also opens the way for a lot of insidious blaming as well. Thank you, Keith. Andy? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Keith. That was really uh, very much uh, uh, relevant to a lot of the conversations that I've been having. So as mentioned, we had a select committee on the coronavirus crisis uh, briefing about racial disparities, and we talked about it a couple different ways. I think Keith hit at a, a lot of the, the challenges that we face with just the existing health infrastructure and, and just broader poverty uh, problems that we have as a society and how that's manifested in some of the disproportionate uh, 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 statistics that we're seeing. For instance, the one that really just uh, hit home for me is that one out of every 2,000 Black Americans has died to the coronavirus. Uh, you know, these are the types of, of elements that, that show just how magnified this is. And, and a couple other points to build on, on what Keith said. Uh, there is a, a disproportionate number of, of minority uh, populations, populations of color, uh, that are working these jobs right now as essential workers. Who is restocking your groceries? Who's delivering... Uh, groceries to your house, who is uh, going out there and, and driving the buses and the trains still. There are a lot of folks uh, in my district around New Jersey, around this country, uh, that are, are people of color. So a lot of it is, uh, is thinking about that. For instance, with Asian Americans, there was an estimated 2 million Asian Americans who were deemed essential workers uh, over the last couple of months. And we see, we see that in, in a couple of other places, for instance. So for instance, with healthcare workers, ones that are in many ways most exposed uh, to, uh, to the coronavirus, uh, about 20% of physicians in the United States are Asian American, uh, a lot of Filipino nurses, uh, a lot of other communities that are playing these important roles and, and putting themselves at greater risk. And when I hear from them that not only are they, they fearful for their own lives, but they're going back home. And they don't know if they're able to, to, to sleep in the same house with their families. 
and, and the challenges and the anxiety that that faces uh, across the board. When it comes to the second part of the question, I think it fuses on this in terms of what can we actually do about this? Well, first and foremost, need to really understand these systemic problems within just even our healthcare system uh, across uh, poverty and, and other challenges that we face uh regards to uh, to race and i think that's really getting at some of the, the bigger questions that we were talking about earlier about systemic racism in our country uh in congress we need to be thinking about this in terms of the relief that is being provided to uh, different populations uh is that relief actually getting to the the, the businesses that, that need it most and, and being representative about that uh this was something that we saw problems with with some of the small business support that a lot of times uh, small businesses that are, are minority owned, immigrant owned, that these are maybe businesses that don't have as much of a connection to the banking sector to, to be able to then get to the front of the line for the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, that they would be ones um, that, you know, for instance, uh, a, a huge part of it was about language barriers. Uh, you know, I encountered a lot of, of problems in the Asian American community and the Hispanic community and others where they, they simply, uh, people were not getting uh, information of about testing of, of the virus or where to turn to to be able to get relief, to understand how the Paycheck Protection Program and other relief elements happen. Uh, so I start to even get concerned of, of whether or not there are, are people in some of these communities learning about how they can get tested, how they can get support and help. And what I came to understand is that actually only four states in the United States right now are collecting data uh, breakdown by race in terms of who is actually getting tested. We have better data in terms of who is, uh, more accurate data in terms of who is uh, dying because of the virus. But in terms of hospitalizations and in terms of testing, we don't actually know if, if, if people are getting tested at uh, proportionate levels and, and, and if that is impacting the number of people that we are seeing with fatalities. So we're just missing a lot of the data. Uh, we are, uh, that should be driving a lot of the actions that, that we in Congress and elsewhere in the federal government are taking. And then there's the bigger question about what comes next. What kind of world are we going to reopen into? Uh, we know it's not going to be the same world that we uh, we socially distanced from a couple months ago. And uh, that tied on top of, of these this new crisis of, of, of uh, emerging right now in our country. It's going to push us to, to really think through uh, all these different elements and what role we should be playing uh, to, to setting the stage for that type of hopefully greater equal uh, access to health care and, and to other resources. So those are just some of the, the key uh, topics that we discussed in the committee, as well as some of the conversations that I'm having with my colleagues in Congress. Great. Thanks, Andy and Keith. I want to give um, both Beth and, and Helen, if they'd like, uh, a chance to, to, to weigh in a little bit. I, I was struck by the the description that Keith made about the, the, the ways in which the anti-Asian violence uh, can, can be both uh, focused on how, how base uh, and, and kind of dirty the, the Chinese are. This relates to what, what Beth had mentioned earlier about the historic uh, prejudices against early Chinese immigrants, but then also this at the same time this sense that the that the sophistication uh, advancement of the, of the Chinese in terms of their scientific advancement and their ability to potentially create a virus that would infect the world. That might be one place to start, but I'd, I'd love to hear thoughts about that as well as, as anything else that was raised by, by Keith and Andy. Well, I think those points that you just uh, raised, Ali, are, are some of the um, ways in which the Asian Americans in this country are really caught in between two very uh, clear and persistent tropes about who we are. And these are um, uh, perceptions or descriptions, portrayals that we ourselves never created and, and never really reflected um, uh, the reality of Asian American life. But so we have um, the model minority, the scientists who, uh, who if they, behave and never complain and just do their work uh, like the coolies did on the railroad, except these are now today high tech coolies, and instead just are obedient. They're acceptable Asians. However, if they step beyond that, we have now this, you know, ongoing um, uh, clear China bashing environment as we go, especially into this election. We already see that that's in the GOP uh, playbook. 
to blame everything on China. And it does seem that the Democratic uh, you know, Party has already made a, a, a PSA more or less the same. And so, um, so that's then the model minority can become the evil scientist who is also spreading disease. And then, you know, going back to the, uh, you know, the 1800s, just our physical bodies are disease carrier, carriers, subhuman. And, and so this is what, when we walk in this world today as Asian Americans in this hyper um, racially tense environment, talking about issues of systemic racism and what has to be done about it, where do Asians fit in? We can be either the model minority, the quiet ones, or if we go a little too far, evil, evil scientists or just by, you know, and so, so the challenge is to have to, um, and this is the conversation that is going on in the Asian American community. How do we break through these things? Because we see Asian American health workers on their way to work who are getting attacked. You know, maybe uh, they just saved somebody's mother, brother, sister, um, STEM worker in the scientific field who are working on a cure and a vaccine for many different diseases. And, and uh, not only is it a threat, but last week the president did make a presidential proclamation to ban the visas for you know, um, some of the scientific uh, graduate students. And that's gonna affect Princeton as well and every other scientific um, institution. But these are policy measures um, similar to the Chinese Exclusion Act that are actually actively being discussed today. And so, uh, so we do see this, and this is kind of where Asian Americans have been caught in this, um, you know, sort of racial trope, you know, a triangle between black and white, where do Asians fit in? How, but, but unlike the 1800s, there are now more than 20 million Asian Americans and the Princeton campus reflects that too. And people are in positions of being able to speak out and make a difference, you know, at, like Congressman Kim here, who is one of the representatives now getting actively involved in getting elected to uh, positions. And that's the kind of thing that, um, you know, our Asian American community actually has to do more of and speak out. I, I just like to say one other thing is that um, in the Twin Cities where George Floyd was murdered, um, that also is home to one of the largest and poorest communities of Asian Americans. And they are now facing a double attack because this lumping together effect of all Asians, not only being the same, but if you have a, a racist Asian cop who is part and complicit in this murder, then that must mean that all Asian Americans are also complicit. And that's not true, but that is also part of the way that Asian Americans are viewed so that that very poor communi community of Southeast Asians, mainly in the Twin Cities, is now facing a lot of physical attack. Um, their shops, their neighborhoods are getting burned to the ground, actually, and devastated. And the, the pro-Black, pro-Black Lives Matter Asian Americans are now being subject to uh, death threats and hate because of the way their community has been uh, targeted too. So there's a lot wrapped up here for Asian Americans. And it's, it's only when we, uh, as a community, speak up and say, no, this is what we're about um, against systemic racism. And this is what we're going to do with where we are. That is the only way we can actually break through these tropes. Beth, uh, Beth would you like to come in here? I guess I'd like to pick up um, a different uh, thing that I heard from um, Andy and Keith, which is the lack of um, the, the lack of data that we have on this. Um, and I, in particular, I was thinking about unemployment. Um, and it, in addition to the the health disparities that we see, the inequality we see, the access to health care, um, and the the death rates for African Americans, there's also this un we are seeing unequal rates of unemployment. Um, and it really struck me that in the May statistics of unemployment, um, essentially all uh, unemployment in general went down a bit from the month before, except for with two groups, uh, African Americans and Asian Americans, uh, which continued, the, the, no, the roles of unemployed has continued to rise in those two groups. And I think that, that you know, that 
that suggests that we, this is a, um, one of the places in which these two communities experiences is overlapping, um, perhaps for very different reasons, but we have so little data on um, what is driving this uh, racial inequity we see in unemployment in particular that I, I'd really like to, um, I think it's an essential piece uh, to, the, to the racial inequality we see here. Thanks, Beth. I want to I want to move to a couple more questions that I, I want to ask of, of of all four panelists, and the first one really picks up on this this notion that, that Helen and, and others have raised about mo being a model Asian Americans being a model minority, um, and uh, and occupying a very complicated role within the American racial framework or hierarchy. Um, I'd love to hear people's thoughts about how that model minority myth perpetuates racism against African Americans and, and, and potentially against other people of color. And, and also about how it um, mutes the, the, dif the diversity, as Helen pointed out and others have pointed out, the diversity within the Asian American community, um, sort of marginalizing many of the low income uh, Asian American communities that are that are often not thought about in this conversation. So I'd love to hear a little bit about that, as well as what Asian Americans can do to address racism in a productive way. Um, and then the second question is, um, you know, the, the country is in anguish uh, about the murder of George Floyd. Many of us have talked about it here. Many, many others have been, uh, you know, protesting peacefully about this for, for many days now. Um, his death is, is emblematic of a political and economic system that devalues black lives. And so I would love to hear people's perspectives about how governments and, and, and their agencies deliver on the justice that protesters and the public are, are so desperately seeking here. How can different government agencies, whether it's those that oversee healthcare or unemployment or policing, um, how can they shift their frameworks, their, their priorities, um, how can they be remade so that they can deliver on the justice that, that we all believe is so necessary? So uh, maybe I'll jump in very quickly on um, both fronts. I think that the, the model minority language obvious, uh, you know, is often used to um, to explain that there, there are some ethnic groups that have come and have uh, achieved success, upward mobility, uh, and you know there, there's a way in which it is so clearly defined against the black experience, uh, as if to say, if others can, and sometimes it's explicitly articulated, if other groups can come to this country uh, and take advantage of opportunity and rise and become successful, then why can't blacks? And and this is to sort of always highlight that it is somehow individual capacity, it is merit. It is intelligence. You know, these are the kind of individualized traits that are often used. It's never about social networks. Uh, it's never, I mean, we have a president who, you know, no one, you know, everyone knows that you don't achieve the kind of success in life if you're not for him if you're not born to wealth but the language of model minority is often used as a as an ex i mean the, the implicit point is that there are non-model minorities and who are they so it's a it's a phrase that kind of inherently does disservice to others uh, but what i would also say is if you step back from it you know i don't usually in my writing and scholarship write about white supremacy that is to say, but I do write about whiteness. That is to say, you know, what are the models of whiteness that are being used to judge these other experiences? Because after all, it's often these, it's often other groups that are creating these tropes. And the reason why I do think that white supremacy is a useful way of thinking right now at this moment is because you have a president who is himself trafficking in the language of dominance, that is to say, we need to dominate, not just protesters who are, might be black, but we need to dominate the Chinese, that we are under threat. And he is telling that, and the language is to white 
working class, rural Americans who, if they protest the governor in Michigan because they're upset about the closing down of the economy, he, he sees them as a hero. But at the same time, we should dominate urban protesters. So it seems to me that, you know, he makes the language of kind of dominance and white supremacy explicit. It's right there out in the open. I mean, we don't have to actually. So I, I guess what I'm saying is that we can think about model minority and non-model minorities as they relate to one another, but we really need to look at it in the context of the broader conversation about race and belonging and questions of supremacy, which are used to be implicit in political discourse, and they've, they used to be explicit, then they became implicit. And over the last, I'd say, since Obama was president, they become increasingly explicit. Um, and this is really where we find ourselves uh, right at this moment. I can, I'll pause before I speak to your other question and let others jump in on the model minority question. Great. Thanks, Keith. You know, I may turn to Andy now. I know he's got to leave in a few minutes, so I'm going to give him a chance to respond to those questions and actually give us any kind of closing, closing words that he wants to share. Yeah, I appreciate that. And uh, you know, again, building off of um, Keith's really good insights here, I, I think, you know, there, there really gets at this question about, you know, what does it mean for the United States to be a mixing pot? Or what does the achievement of the American dream actually mean now in the 21st century? And, uh, you know, th those kind of big uh, questions I see kind of come up constantly with the different work that I've done. Now, as, as you mentioned before, you know, I'm, a, I'm a, in Congress now, but for this, I was uh, at the State Department, I was at the Pentagon, I've, I've been seeing sort of different angles of this. And, and so often I see is that, that uh, the conversations between what are the differing levels for different minority communities, it's often pitched in some ways as if it's a zero sum game that these different minority communities are competing against each other. Uh, and that one, one's progress is at the, at the other's detriment. And, and, and I think that that has been perpetuated in, in ways that are clearly untrue, uh, but has hurt the ability to try to coalesce and, and see the commonalities uh, between our experiences. I, I've been really heartened by working in Congress uh, with, with uh, multiple other con uh, caucuses. Uh, we have what's called the, the Quad Caucus, which is a Congressional Black Caucus, the Hispanic Caucus, the Asian American and Pacific Islander Caucus, as well as uh, the, the Native American Caucus, and uh, you know our, our abilities to, to look out for each other, and having to be able to stand alongside my colleagues from the Congressional Black Caucus a couple months ago, where where they were outraged about the xenophobia against Asian Americans uh, because of the coronavirus when that was emerging, and then for us now as the Asian American Caucus to be able to stand alongside our Congressional Black Caucus uh, and, and and support the legislation that they put forward today uh, that are trying to make uh, significant efforts to be able to, to move our country towards greater racial equality. You know, the, those are hopefully some of the elements that, that help break down uh, some of these barriers and help create a, a broader coalition and, and an understanding in that direction. And I experience that every day in my district. I'm, I'm the only Korean American in Congress. I'm, I represent a district that's 85% white that voted for Trump by six points as less than 1% Korean American, less than 3% Asian American. And you know, there, there are, are, are a lot of questions about how do you build a coalition? How do you show that, that someone like myself and, and the color of my skin doesn't impede my ability to represent a district that vastly looks different than, than I do? And, and I think that that type of element of, of being able to find those threads to show that my story as a Korean American, as an Asian American, is fundamentally an American story. Uh, you know, those are some of the threads that I'm trying to work on as we move forward to, to next steps and to just conclude on that. Uh, you know, I, I think that, and, and pull this, you know, as I'm going to have to take off, um, in terms of the next steps, uh, first of all, I, th I think it's important to, to, to have a lot of humility right now uh, and for, for everyone to, to spend a lot of time listening. You know, a lot of voices want to be heard right now, and it's so important, especially for those of us in, in elected offices and, and offices where we represent others, to, to really try to listen 
looked into that and, and to try to understand uh, the, the, the complexities that are there. You know, working alongside my colleagues in the Congressional Black Caucus over the last week, um, you know, we were on a phone call actually just a couple of days ago and just be able to hear the guidance and words and wisdom from, from, from people like Brian Stevenson and, and others who have just, you know, seen a lot of, of this injustice up close and personal. And then to be able to do this alongside, and I hear the voice of my colleague, John Lewis, uh, on the phone and, and for him to, to remind us of the moment that we're in, you know, what they were saying is just reminding us that right now the world is watching. Uh, what, reminding us that, that right now uh, a lot is at stake and uh, that we recognize that oftentimes when it comes to these deeper wounds and the systemic problems that we face, it feels sometimes hopeless. It feels too big of a burden for us to, to power through. But the greatest enemies to our, our democracy isn't necessarily uh, the the inequalities that, that we're facing each and every day, it's, it, it would be apathy in the face of it. It'd be wreck, it'd be as if we felt that there was nothing that we could do and as a result, it just has to be that way. Uh, but I think the, you know, the voices that I've heard over the last week inspire me to just continue to, to think through what it is that we're able to achieve and what world we're going to be able to emerge out into after these multiple crises. So you know, the, the, our country is facing a lot New Jersey has faced a lot. Uh, we have over 12,000 deaths due to the coronavirus. If we were a country, we would be number seven in the world for coronavirus deaths. There's a lot that we have to, to grapple with. Uh, but uh, for uh, despite all the, the challenges that we face, you know, what I've taken away going to some of these marches is as a, a semblance of hope that, that sometimes I don't always say, but I'm not always able to carry with me. So I'm certainly going to try to make some of these changes in Congress. Uh, take for this, but uh, also just be inspired by this new generation of leadership. A lot of our students and young Americans that are stepping up right now and leading a lot of these uh, rallies and, and protests and, and other elements of it. So with that, I, I, I end with a message of hope. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. Thanks for your perspectives today and for your leadership in, in New Jersey and, and in DC. Thank you. Um, I want to turn back to this question about model minorities. Um, and give uh, either Beth or Helen or both a, a chance to, to weigh in um, on, on the question of model minority status, but also thinking about how we can, uh, how the African American and Asian American communities can work together. You know, Beth mentioned that there are points of uh, similar experience, uh, you know, referencing, referencing unemployment numbers recently, and there are obviously many others. Would love to hear from from either of you about ways in which those communities can find both acknowledge the tensions and and, and real differences, but also find opportunities for for solidarity and and you know common perspective, common purpose. So if, I'll start on the darker side, and Helen can talk about how to bring these communities together. Um, you know, one thing I did want to point out is that I think we often talk about the model minority. And in fact, I, I heard it a little bit from um, Helen and Keith. We talk about the idea of the model minority as coming from white America. But I think that in, as part of this conversation, I think it's pretty, I think it's essential that we understand that the model minority has also come from the Asian American community that there are elements within the Asian American community that have embraced this stereotype. Um, and the stereotype suggests that there's some sort of cultural superiority within Asians as a culture, uh, a cultural uh, superiority compared to black culture um, quite explicitly. And that that's what's allowed Asian Americans to succeed when African Americans have quote unquote failed at overcoming um, it, uh, systems of inequality that were faced by both groups. Um, so I, I just, I think of the model minority and what Asian Americans need to do about this stereotype is partially to acknowledge that, um, that buying into that stereotype is a form of anti-blackness. Um, so when Asian Americans embrace the idea that they have some sort of cultural superiority, um, that something about the way their work ethic 
the way that they organize their families, um, the way they study for the SAT is, is superior, um, that they are buying into an idea not just of sort of um, uh, cultural pride, but also of anti-blackness. Um, so I think it really is important to recognize that all this although the stereotype came from outside the community, it has now become you know, part of the community and something that we need to grapple with in order to go forward. Thanks, Beth. Helen? Yeah, I have to say I agree with both Keith and Beth completely on this matter of what is the model minority, how it is um, being complicit with a system of domination that Keith was talking about and, and, and really the origins of the model minority and the function that it plays is part of the domination of, of uh, the way America uh, was formed and the domination that keeps systems, uh, systemic racism in place so that there can be a dominating uh, class group, whether we call it white, su white supremacy or not. Um, but that's how uh, the model minority fits in. And it was explicit because um, when I was a young a student and at Princeton, the model minority, the very terminology emerged in 1966. It's a, uh, a historic fact of, of when the um, concept was first floated to say that there is, uh, by virtue of their hard work, quietly moving along, succeeding in America, and not with a welfare check, uh, this model minority, these Japanese Americans and Chinese Americans are moving ahead. And this was in 1966, obviously, when the civil rights movement was in bloom. And, and it's very clear, if there's a good minority, then who's the bad minority? And I think as, and this, this whole idea of divide and conquer, and create a wedge, uh, which is how a group stays in power. I mean, it's just, you know, um, the Trojan horse in our society. It's, it's something that uh, every dominating group has learned how to play. And in the United States, it's a very, very potent tool. And that Asian Americans who buy into that are basically taking that carrot. You know, the idea that you can be almost like an honorary member of the dominating group. You can get the rewards of that if you be the model, then you won't be like the bad minority. I mean, that, that is really something. And what gives me heart to not stay in the dark side as, you know, of this question of who the, you know, this model minority thing is that um, I have been listening to many, many young activists today about uh, number one, affirmative action, which is another, another um, tool to try to break down the divisions, you know, back in the 60s, and then became uh, weaponized, you know, and turned against communities of color, especially African American communities um, in modern day. And some of the model minority believing Asian Americans have jumped onto that um, whole anti affirmative action wagon. And, but at the same time, there are many, many young Asian American activists who reject that and say, we have to, this, this only feeds into our, you know, oppression as Asian Americans in this country if we buy into that. And uh, I just heard yesterday um, a young Asian American activist in Houston talking about, you know, you can act like the good minority, follow everything that the model minority offers. You can become that top cancer researcher at MD Anderson, or you could become a top physicist and become the chair of the physics department at a major university. And then with the climate we are in, you can be uh, arrested, you can be deported, you can be accused of not being patriotic and you can lose everything. So this whole model minority really is a, you know, a false carrot that's being offered there, but is uh, premised on uh, being used as a wedge to keep the domination happening. And so uh, I'm very heartened to see that there's a lot more people now questioning that role, including the older people, <laughs> you know, the newer immigrants who are actually taking some of the Black Lives Matter YouTubes and videos and translating them into Chinese and actually putting them with, um, you know, subtitles 
so that they can, uh, so that the newer immigrants can really understand where the, uh, you know, the outrage is coming from and the discussion about systemic racism and what has to happen so that there is an upside that people are questioning this and their own role in the domination and, and uh, systemic racism. Thanks, Helen. Could I, could I add something to that, which is to, just to further complicate the story by pointing out that the that what Helen and Beth and Andy were are, are kind of describing is is how race works in America, and just to further complicate it by pointing out that as a historian, I would sometimes assign chapters from a book on the 19th century called "How the Irish Became White," which is to say that the Irish were not white in those early days of, and then there's another really excellent study called How the Jews Became White, uh, which is uh, really focuses on the mid part of the 20th century in the same time that the model minority notion of for Asians was being constructed. And what this really highlights and what I often think about is that it's precisely at the time that Obama became elected. And here you have a kind of a achieving African American man who really achieves the, you know something that none of us imagined would have happened in our lifetimes at, at the same time that Americans began to hear that that um, in 20 30 years we would ultimately have a white minority that that minorities would become the majority and we're still heading there and it's precisely at this time that you see this new form of kind of white supremacy oriented language uh, and D Donald Trump sort of as its main spokesperson. So to me, these are the examples of how race works. It's kind of like whiteness under threat. And, and there is the history of assimilation into whiteness. So the Irish would not think of themselves as non-white today. Uh, but there is also this effort to also police the boundaries of appropriate whiteness. And in some ways, thinking about where we are historically, we're right in the middle of one of the largest conflagrations around this issue. And people like George Floyd are in some ways the victims, right? Because, and this gets to sort of how these ideas get, get embedded in institutions, and get enfolded into practices of policing, of uh, lending at banks, um, at you know every walk of life, you have to deal with this kind of mythos about race uh, and about who dominates and who should be submissive. Thanks, Keith. I want to I want to move us to our, our last two questions and, and pick up on some of the themes we've been talking about here. Uh, particularly starting with the, the question of institutions. So all of us uh, on this on the Zoom today um, have an affiliation with Princeton, and several members of the audience have asked about the responsibility. This is an audience question. What is the responsibility that an elite and historically white institution like Princeton has to advance racial justice? And what responsibility do other institutions, universities, governments, corporations, nonprofit organizations, what responsibility do, do they have? And then how should they deliver on that responsibility? That's, that's the first question. And then the second question is a, is a future-oriented question. So each of you have written a book, uh, at least one book, some, some several books about different episodes in American history. What do you think, what do you expect will be the cultural and psychic legacy of this pandemic? How will historians, especially those who are interested in issues of race, view this pandemic in 50 years or 100 years? Beth? Okay, if I um, will start. I, well, I think um, when we ask what institutions can do, I think the first thing is we need to listen uh, to what, um, at this moment, particularly what the Black Lives Matter movement is asking of institutions and of individuals. Um, I think that a lot of what we do should be in direct response, um, that it shouldn't be sort of uh, uh, our own understandings of reform, but the reforms that are at being asked um, by the people that are leading this movement. And I so what I hear is they're asking for 
us to educate ourselves, um, uh, to renounce privilege, um, to defund or abolish the police and think about other ways that we can uh, structure our society in order to protect the people um, and provide social services as opposed to uh, kill or, or hurt the people. Um, but I also think that within the university itself, um, I think that there's many ways that we can um, sort of liberate the resources of an elite institution like Princeton University. Um, I think that, you know, the, the ways in which Princeton is you know, elite, um, it has its wealth, its prestige, and its space um, can be used uh, to support and uplift uh, community organizations. So that's about, you know, it, it's as easy as a student group deciding that what they want to spend their money on instead of, uh, you know, a cultural party or something like that is they want to spend money on bringing community organizers to campus. That's a simple way in which we're using Princeton's resources to listen to a larger um, and, and hook into a larger movement. Um, for racial justice. So in addition to thinking about how to liberate resources, I also think we have to do a lot of internal thought about academia. Um, there's many uh, different ways we can do that. And there's lots of things that need reform. But I would um, highlight, since we're talking a lot about the African-American, Asian-American community, I would bring out again what Helen was saying about affirmative action. Because I do hear a lot of um, conflicting opinions in the Asian American community around affirmative action. Um, one optimistic thing is I tend to hear from my students that they support affirmative action, my Asian American students, that they support Asian um, affirmative action, but their parents don't. Um, and I think that that is uh, a really, um, uh, it's an important thing that the Asian American community needs to think through uh, because I don't think that it, these are compatible ideas. I don't think that you can be pro Black Lives Matter, that you can support this movement, that you can recognize the systemic inequality um, and anti-blackness and devaluing of black lives that not only leads to police brutality, but also to unequal K through 12 education. Uh, without also supporting the ideas of affirmative action and insisting that we need a diverse student body at a place like Princeton. Um, so I think that in particular, the Asian American community has a lot of work to do to talk about this issue, that, that one um, way to support black lives is to support affirmative action going forward. Thanks, Beth. Helen, would you like to get in here? Sure. Um, I'm also remembering that when I was a student on campus and, and uh, in the early 70s, it was a time of great institutional change. It was the years of co-education for Princeton. But at, in, in, in addition to co-education, it was when students of color were first being admitted in any numbers, and I was um, part of that wave. And so, so there are generations who are still alive who remember you know that we've gone through periods of, of uh, a great um, self-examination in this country and looking at how things could change um, that included things like the civil rights uh, laws equality um, um, as well as for immigration and that's one reason that we now have 20 million um, more than 20 million Asian Americans in this country because in 1965 the Immigration Act was equalized as part of the civil rights movement. Um, and so institutions have changed and I think we are at a moment today where um, just by seeing the uh, brute force and, and cold-blooded murder committed by, you know, in the uniform of the state that people that I'm surprised and institutions corporations are actually saying what can we do we have to do something we have to do something systemic and so for um, institutions like Princeton um, it was back when I was a student almost 50 years ago that we talked about having Asian American Latinx Native American African American studies and so uh, it has taken time but um, I'm 
thrilled that now we, after so many years, have had some movement toward Asian American and Latinx uh, studies. Uh, you know, we do have a center for um, African American studies at Princeton, which is world class, and we should be making the uh, American studies, um, you know, frankly, compulsory in my opinion, at, at every higher uh, institution, uh, institution of higher ed, and, and actually into um, high schools and K, uh, you know, K through 12, because this is the world that we are entering, you know, as um, Keith pointed out. And I actually think it's going to be within 10 years watching demographic uh, projections, but you know, 10 states, California have already reached that point where whiteness is a minority. And so um, uh, there was a lot left quite undone out of the 60s. And, and, and we see this legacy today of where we are at this point. And, um, you know, to the point of um, the, the election of Barack Obama, I think we can also see that that was a point where the right, the areas of domination, the people who had that, that white anxiety started, you know, the whole thing about post-civil rights, post-race, post-feminism, post-everything, because, hey, you know, we have a Black president. And uh, clearly, clearly, all of the fault lines we see today show that um, that anxiety has become even stronger and why so many people are talking about how do we change our institutions. And that is going to take questioning our own privilege. Um, Princeton is a, an institution that is training its elite students to be the leaders, opinion makers, uh, policy makers of the world. And so uh, it is also a place where um, that reflection about if we are going to be training the next elite to, to be changing the world, what is it changing it to? What are, the, how can we uh, train the students at Princeton and the alumni to be thinking about how do we use the privilege that you have to um, to really not replicate what was before because we can't go back to normal. Normal is what brought us here. And so the whole point is if we're at an inflection point in society today of the possibility of making change, um, you asked about the future. You know, if we could look back uh, in history, people say, to uh, Germans, for example, what did you do when Hitler rose to power? You know, what did you do about that? And you, you know, when you're in the moment of history, it's hard to know what those choices are. But we're in a moment today, as as uh, people affiliated with, you know, a, a great institution like Princeton, many alumni, students who might be watching. What are we doing today to make sure that we don't end up going to um, you know, in a direction that just reinforces where we are. And another generation one day is going to have to rise up in protest. Um, so I think that's the question and how Princeton as an institution can contribute to opening up people's minds and questioning what they can do um, and what our networks and other institutions can do and what policies can happen. That, that's where I think we are today and that's going to make a big difference in the future. Thanks, Helen. Keith, I want to give you a couple minutes to respond, and then I'm going to turn us to uh, our closing remarks. I see we have about 12 minutes left. Great. Yeah, I, I just want to say a couple things. One is that um, you asked about, you know, how this would be seen 100 years from now, but also what this means for institutions. Um, you know, I, I, there's a part of me that wants to make sure that this is not another, uh, and I, it, I don't think it will be, it isn't already, another Katrina moment, as in, you know, a horrible event happens. Uh, we discover poverty. We discover inequality. Uh, we kind of, or another death happens, Eric Garner, um, and we discover police brutality, and then it um, recedes into the background to be taken over by some other event uh, distracting our lives. I think the reason why this is different is it does matter that it came atop a, um, that, that uh, George Floyd's death came atop a pandemic. And I think there's a way in which um, the, the convergence, you know, the pandemic also already showed people how vulnerable we all are. 
uh, it made us hyper aware of uh, that vulnerabilities manifest itself uh, on top of inequalities. But we are all basically, if, even if we don't want to believe it, in this together. And then when um, George Floyd is, is murdered in, in Minneapolis, I think it, um, you know, it highlights once again vulnerability and it calls on, and I, I've actually been kind of surprised and shocked by how many people identify with him and identify with what happened to him and see it as a rallying cry. So yeah, it exists on top of a multitude of other kinds of insults and injuries uh, to black lives, but it also kind of like drew more people in. Maybe there's something particularly shocking about that video as well. So the question is like, how do institutions respond to this? I mean, you know, I think we're at a point where our institutions have not fared well in the last uh, three or four months, whether it's institutions of, of healthcare, uh, the CDC, uh, our inability to test, let alone um, care, uh, our institutions, institutions of governance uh, from the very top, but state by state, and then uh, obviously the institutions of policing right, which have also failed. So it's a moment of both crisis for institutions, but also the possibility of reinvention and renewal. And the way I'd put it is this, that, um, you know, Princeton is like the, the, the notoriously people call it the Princeton bubble, right, as if it's kind of like ideally insulated from everything else that goes. And at the same time, Princeton imagines itself as kind of like connected to the world, right? In service of the nation, in service of all nations. Um, and yet, you know, w one of the things this moment does is it challenges institutions to think about how to align itself with the forces of good and the forces of reform at this moment. And I'll give you just one example. Like I read the defund the police movement as a challenge to say, look, if we care about public safety and if we care that the police are there to safeguard all of our health and all of our welfare, then how do you reimagine the police to actually carry out that function for which ideally they are designed because they're not doing that right now. And I think, you know, we have a system that says in the healthcare that it's about health, but our medical system was not designed to deal with this health crisis. We're designed to deal with like people with heart attacks, but not like how do you ensure the public health? And so I think the same challenge should be brought to our institutions of higher education right? Like, what is the purpose of education, right? How do we challenge ourselves to be better? Um, th these are the kinds of things that I would say, like, how do you make institutions that are usually slow, deliberative, really, you know, and, and who claim to embody the highest values, how does this moment allow, push them to ask, like, what are you doing? to make this situation better beyond just like giving people, I mean, giving, I believe deeply, deeply in higher education, but there's a moment, this is a moment at which we have to think beyond just like a four year degree, right? Like we are trying to do something with regard to creating citizens that are capable of providing guidance and leadership in this moment. So what does citizenship really mean in this moment? So at the level of classrooms and at the level of institution, this is really what we should all be doing. Thanks, Keith. Um, uh, I wanna, as we bring this conversation to a close, I wanna invite each of our panelists to offer, uh, you know, concluding remarks. Um, obviously, feel free to address any, anything that you've heard today um, and, and if you'd like one prompt, um, as you think about the people who are listening today, I think we have over a thousand people who are, who are with us electronically, um, and especially thinking about the young people who are, who are with us on this Zoom, what can they do individually as, as young people, as, as individuals, as Americans, what can they do to heal, uh, heal racial inequ inequities and inequalities? So we'd love to, to, to hear any concluding thoughts uh, from our panel and I'll start with Beth and then go to, go to Helen and then to Keith. Well, one thing that I usually say 
to the young people that I get to teach is that they, I hope that they are uncomfortable with the present, always. That there's always something uncomfortable um, and that they put themselves in uncomfortable positions and they have uncomfortable conversations. Because I think if we become comfortable with the status quo, there's something wrong. Um, and I, so I, I do believe that individuals and individual conversations and individual attitudes matter, even as we have talked a lot today about uh, systems, systemic racism, institutions, really large concepts. Um, I think what I'd like to say by way of conclusion is that I just really, I was happy to have the opportunity to talk um, about Black and Asian American experiences together today. Uh, I think so often when we think about race in America in general and when we talk about race in this COVID era, we think about it along a white black binary. And I think that putting these two groups together is important in part because it reminds us that sort of systems of racial oppression are, like I said before, they're, they're different for different groups, but they are linked. And I think that one very specific example of this is, we, you know, we're talking right now about anti-Blackness and police brutality, but of course this is linked to, uh, to immigrant detention and ICE. Right? These are very clear links that we can see. Uh, the fact that these forms of oppression are different and linked, I think that we also see or we hope that liberation for these, for people of color are, again, they're going to look different, but they are still linked projects. Uh, I think that the, the pandemic has created major disruption in the world. Um, and as a historian, I know that moments of disruption cause change, that cause societal change. And what we hope, I think, what we can hope is to, to um, make this change, make changes deliberately, not just have this disruption have all of its, its aftermath. Um, to, take this moment of disruption to think about how we want to reform society um, and especially to pay attention to issues of racial justice. Beth, Helen, final words. I think that was incredibly well said and eloquent. Thank you very much, um, Beth. And I would only add this note that we are at the beginning of this pandemic of the virus at this beginning of the pandemic of this global racism and that whether the racism is toward Asian Americans or we're talking about the systemic racism toward African Americans, racism and hate and violence spreads. It's not isolated to any one group. And so, so we're at the beginning of something and we're also at a moment where um, globally people are rising up and saying, you know, this has to change. And so just, I, I'd just like to um, agree with everything that Beth just said about we're all in it together, that the global pandemic of COVID is not going to be cured unless all communities join together. And that includes ones that have been and are being isolated as the strategic enemy of the United States, like China. Um, that can shift at any moment, too, of what country is uh, considered to be, um, you know, not, not worth joining in together with. But we are actually, you know, have to take that, take this moment to say, how do we come together? And I'm so heartened to see that so many, especially so many young people are out, well, of course, at my age, everybody is younger, but so many people are out saying, you know what, this is not the world we want to be in. And to take this moment and connect the dots and see that our survival, our liberation is really, um, you know, all hand in hand with each other. So, uh, so I just really look forward to the leadership, the continuing leadership of the, the generations that are coming up now, because they have to do better than my generations did. Thanks, Helen. And finally, Keith. Right. Uh, I, I just would build on these by saying that, um, you know, we have a virtue of being in the middle uh, or the early part or the middle of this story. And it is a story that has unmade uh, 
many things in the world and this country. And it, we have the possibility of thinking about what should be reinvented or what should be remade in its wake. And, you know, it's funny, I, I feel like I'm learning more from young people than I have to teach at this particular juncture. Um, I, I feel as if, you know, there's, there's a f interesting story. I mean, I can't help thinking epidemiologically as a historian of medicine, that it's the, the elderly who are the most at risk at, for the death from COVID-19. And, you know, epidemiologically anyway, it's not that young people aren't at risk. They're at high risk for transmitting it but they're not as high risk. And they happen to be the people who are also out in the streets. And they're kind of bringing the fight to others. And so there's a kind of a story here about who's challenging whom and on how many different levels. Like if you run into a 50 year old cop, right? Like who's at risk? Uh, yes, you're at risk, you know, for brutality, but there's something else going on here. So we're learning more about young people in this particular moment. And so what I think is important is to listen um, and to see the kind of fascinating coalitions that are emerging, like Andy Kim talked about them, we're seeing them on the streets. Uh, those are going to last and embracing those coalitions uh, because they are the vehicle for social change. Uh, of the kind that Beth just talked about, like seeing that, you know, rather than splitting minority groups, seeing how their interests converge. And then I think the last thing I would say is to rethink these old tropes of um, who's a model and who's not a model. Um, rethinking race, you know, what is embedded in those terms and these ideas about race. And then, I mean, I just did not to be too like, uh, you know, end on a particular note, but in some ways, you know, there is this thing where everybody on the streets are identifying with George Floyd. And it's a really, you know, deeply sad and also horrifying experience, you know, uh, experience that we are trying to understand how this could happen. And in a way, I think, you know, the thing that you might do to um, build a better world is to realize that we're all George Floyd in some way or another, or at least that we should think about ourselves in that way. And that's a, maybe a path forward and to, to realize sort of what our commitments are to life, humanity, um, and betterment in society more generally, and then to reconstruct institutions around that, wherever you might be. Great. Thank you, all of you, for your, for your poignant comments um, throughout the hour, and, and especially kind of leaving us, leaving the audience with some, some really important uh, perspectives to, to, to digest. Um, over the last few weeks, several people have quoted Abraham Joshua Heschel, who marched with Martin Luther King and Selma. Uh, he said famously that few about racism, few are guilty, but all are responsible. While most of us readily denounce racism, I don't think we've all fully acknowledged the extent of our complicity in it uh, and the privileges we enjoy because of it. And nor have we taken seriously the power and agency we have to address it. And I think what, what many of you on the, on the, uh, have said over this last 90 minutes have really helped us to see that we do have agency, whether it's through our conversations or through the actions that we take through our institutions or the ways in which we build coalition uh, you know, with other communities. Our panelists have all shared some thoughts about how to affect change at the individual and institutional levels. And for, for the audience, speaking to the audience, I hope that you found inspiration in their perspectives, as well as the perspectives of the many leaders and activists who have been helping us to make sense of this really exceptional moment that we're now in. We also hope that this conversation has motivated you, those of you who are in the audience, to take decisive action against racism, whether it's through conversations within your family, uh, through your classrooms and conference rooms at work, your Zoom rooms, obviously, for, for the duration of this pandemic, and, and also at the ballot box this fall. Before we conclude, I want to mention two ways that you can stay engaged with this conversation. First, if you'd like to hear more from Professor Keith Weilu, 
You can listen to him on the latest episode of Princeton's We Roar podcast, in which he discusses, as he did today, the, extraordinarily the extraordinary racial disparities in COVID-19 outcomes and the intersecting vulnerabilities that have contributed to them. We Roar is a series of bite-sized reflections from Princetonians sharing their perspectives on the pandemic. And you can find out more, you can hear uh, the, the conversation with, with Professor Weilu as well as many others at weroar.princeton.edu. And second, as was mentioned earlier uh, in the conversation, this is the first virg virtual panel in a series on equity in the COVID crisis. Um, that's being organized by the Office of the Vice Provost for Institutional Equity and Diversity. Uh, we encourage you to go to inclusive.princeton.edu and check the news and events link where you'll find more information about future events in this series. With that, I want to thank the panelists for a rich and thought-provoking and, and poignant conversation. I also want to thank the hundreds of audience members who joined us today from around the world, from, from time zones and from nations around the world. We wish you and your communities good health and active engagement in the months ahead. Thank you.